What's up guys, John here and welcome back to John Moon Studios. Today we're going to be talking about the brand new Cubase 12 Pro that just released today. And today's video is going to focus on the brand new feature called MIDI Remote Mapping Assistant. Let's get right to it. So if you've seen pictures of Hans Zimmer Studio or even Junkie XL, you know they use these giant touchscreens in order to control their macros or any kind of quantization, changing of notes, visibility filters, anything like that. Well, Cubase 12 just introduced that to the public, so now we can create our very own MIDI remote mapping assistant. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. So the first thing we're gonna look at is where exactly this is. So if we look at the top right corner here, we're gonna see a brand new button, and this is the Open MIDI Remote Mapping Assistant. If you don't see this here, you're gonna hit the gear sign, and then you're gonna go down here to where it says MIDI Remote Mapping, and then the button will appear. Once we click on it, we're gonna get this menu right here. Now this here is the menu where you're gonna map out the notes to whatever command you want inside of Cubase, which makes this super powerful and something that can be used to create a faster workflow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create one from scratch so you can see exactly how you can apply it and how to create one of your own if you wanna create your own MIDI remote. So now we're gonna get started and the first thing we need to do is we're gonna close off that menu and we're gonna open up the bottom divider because the bottom divider is gonna be the place where you are going to be able to assign the visuals as to what macros or what key commands or what MIDI CCs you're using to control each of these buttons. So we're gonna open up the bottom divider and as you can see, we have a new button down here called MIDI Remote. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna recreate my Nectar Impact LX88 button layout just so you could see how we can customize this. I'm not gonna use the Korg Nano Control 2 because Cubase had already recognized that this was the Korg Nano Control and it automatically laid it out like this for me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna recreate this one simply because the Nectar Impact was not recognized by Cubase so I had to make a layout from scratch but I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit this little gear sign which is going to open up the MIDI Remote Manager and then I'm going to click Disable Controller Script. So once I do that, you're gonna see that now the only one I have is my Nano Control 2. So now I'm gonna go back home here and then you're gonna see that the Nano Control 2 is the only one here. So that's how you disable or remove one of the scripts in case you do not wanna use them anymore. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hit the plus sign and here I'm gonna create the name for this MIDI controller. So I'm using the Nectar Impact LX88 Plus MIDI 1 and Output is the MIDI one as well. So you're gonna choose whatever MIDI controller you're using. And then this is the Nectar. And then here I'm gonna go ahead and write that it is the Impact LX88. Now I would put the plus, but the plus is not allowed. It's like a special character that um, Cubase decided to leave out here, but it's okay. I'm just gonna leave it at LX88. And then I'm gonna go ahead and hit this next button until you don't fill out these two criterias, this button will not appear. So make sure you do fill them out. And then you're going to go ahead and hit next. So now here we have the layout for the LX88 plus. So I thought it would have deleted it, but I guess it didn't. So we're going to have to just continue off of where we were. So essentially all we need to do is set this up once again. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remove all of these. Okay, so we've removed all of the controllers here. Unfortunately, I don't know how to remove it in bulk just right now, so I just went ahead and deleted it one by one. But here we have an empty layout. So we have three options here when we're working. We have a knob option, we have a fader option, and then we have a button option. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the keyboard camera so that you could see exactly what I'm doing on the keyboard because I'm gonna recreate somewhat what this keyboard looks like on the diagram that I have on the screen. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with the faders here on the left side. So here I have nine faders and I want to recreate this these nine faders. So I'm actually gonna do one row of four and then another row of five. So all we need to do is select fader because that's the controller we're mapping here. And then all we need to do is 
click on any of these quadrants because as you can see, you can put these anywhere or you can resize them too. So if you want the fader to be really big or if you want the fader to take up one little box, you could do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna let it take four boxes here and I'm gonna go ahead and click it so that it's on the top left corner. So all I need to do now is move the fader. And as you can see, since I moved the fader, now this one automatically assigns. So now we have our first fader. For number two, I'm gonna go ahead and move just the second fader. There you go, activated third, fourth. As you can see how easy it is to lay out these faders so that you could see them inside of Cubase. Now we're gonna go ahead and map out the next five. So I'm gonna go to this quadrant here. I'm gonna move this one until we reach the fifth one of this row. I've now created these faders. So now what I'm going to do is under it, I'm actually going to create these little buttons as well. So one thing to just keep in mind while you're creating these MIDI remotes. So regardless of what function it does as a MIDI keyboard alone, when you create this inside of Cubase, it's going to override all of that. So it's no longer going to function with the parameters that let's say your keyboard brought. It's going to function with the parameters that you have now overwritten inside of Cubase. So that's really the cool part with all of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna map out these nine buttons now, and I'm gonna give it some space. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna put button, and then I'm gonna just go ahead and click one, two, three, and four. I'm gonna make another row, and then continue five, six, seven, eight, and then nine. So now I have my nine faders and my nine buttons down here. So now on the next side, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start right over here, and I'm gonna go ahead and map out my pots here. So I'm gonna just go ahead and select knob first. And then I'm going to move this one, it already created it, move the second one, the third, the fourth. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do the exact same layout here. So there's kind of like this little slant. So I'm just gonna continue that little design. And we're gonna do one here, one here, one here, and one here. So as you can see, I've now created my pan pots. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna create the little transport function that we have down here. So I'm gonna start on the same exact row and we're gonna start a little bit slanted because it starts a little bit kind of on the edge of the bottom row here. So we're gonna start right over here and we're gonna say that this is a button as well. And then this is gonna be this button, this one here, this one here, this one here, and then the last button on the right here. So as you can see, you can also stretch this out. So you're not just limited to this tiny little space here. You can stretch it out and make it a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna go ahead and just leave it like this so that we could see all the buttons. And now I have laid out everything I needed to see on my keyboard that I wanna work with. So now what we do from here is once you lay out this design, we're gonna go ahead and hit the next button. Now when you hit the next button, the remote mapping assistant is going to appear. If the mapping assistant does not pop up automatically, then we're gonna go ahead and click this little keyboard where it says mapping page. We're gonna click it and then you're gonna see the mapping assistant appear. So this menu is a little bit intimidating when you first see it, but it's actually very intuitive and you can map these buttons to whatever it is that you want super quick. So we're gonna go ahead and just look at the layout really quick. So you see the grid lines have disappeared, but now this looks like the layout that I wanted for my controller. And as you can see, we have a visual representation of this. And even if we close it, these parameters are still gonna work. So if I move these faders, you're gonna see that the controller actually moves in real time with all of the knobs and all of the faders, these buttons as well, you're gonna see them highlight as I touch them. And again, they override the function designed for from the MIDI keyboard because we're overriding it inside of Cubase. So now we're gonna go into the mapping assistant and we're gonna go and select our first command for these buttons. So I'm gonna actually start with the transport function here because I want this to be my main transport function. So on the left on my keyboard, it actually says this is a cycle marker. So let's just actually keep it that way. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this button inside of Cubase and you're gonna see that it says that I've selected a button in the Impact LX88 control. Now we need to select a function. So we're gonna go over here to transport and we're gonna do activate cycle. Now you're gonna see that when I click this, it says the Cubase function is activate cycle. Now you have to hit apply mapping. When you click on it, you're gonna see that all of a sudden the cycle marker symbol is gonna pop up here. Now what's really cool about this is that you can see all of your mapping here. And then if you hit X, 
now the cycle marker symbol has just appeared on your layout. So if I go ahead and click the cycle marker, you're gonna see that it turns on and we have a bright purple, like we have it down here, and now it's activated the cycle marker. So if I actually pull this out from the Cubase project window and I hit cycle, you're gonna see that it now functions as a cycle marker. So let's go ahead and continue mapping this really quick. We're gonna go ahead and click the second button. You can either click it on Cubase or you could click it on your controller. So if I click here, it's gonna be that empty button. We're gonna go and select, this is the rewind. So now I'm gonna hit activate mapping. So same thing here, this is the forward. I'm gonna go ahead and hit activate mapping. We're gonna keep on mapping this to stop. This one is play or start. And then this one's going to be my record. So now I have mapped the six buttons that I have on my keyboard to the six button that I have inside of Cubase. So if I hit play, it's gonna play. If I hit stop, it's gonna stop. Press record, it's gonna be record. If I say to stop and go rewind or fast forward, I can do all of these functions now just from my keyboard. Now let's take it a step further. So now let's say we wanna create these buttons to do specific tasks like maybe key commands. So key commands are super huge inside of Cubase and not just key commands, but macros in general. So macros are essentially a series of key commands clicked by one button so that you can activate whatever it is that you want to activate. So in a previous video, if you haven't seen, I talked about key commands. I showed you guys my film scoring template key command where I added a marker track, where I added a video track, where I added a time signature tempo track, and I told Cubase to divide the project window and put those tracks on the top divider. If you have not seen that video, I'm gonna go ahead and link it on the top right, but we're gonna go ahead and do that now so you can see how we can assign macros to these buttons and again, this is a very, very powerful feature that you should take advantage of. So what I'm gonna do is I deleted the marker track I had there. I'm gonna open this back up, open up the mapping page, and then I'm gonna go to where it says key commands on the right here. I'm gonna open up this drop down, and then I'm gonna find the section that says macro. And then here I have film scoring template. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. So now the Cubase function says film scoring template. And then on my impact, I'm gonna go ahead and click the ninth button, which is the button all the way to the far right. I'm gonna click that and it's gonna say, okay, so you wanna map this button. I'm gonna do apply mapping. And now this button is going to be my macro for this film scoring template. So watch how cool this is. I'm gonna go ahead and close it. And you're gonna see that here in the layout, we have film scoring template. It renames it whatever the macro is called. So now we're gonna go ahead and exit this and we're gonna try it out now. We're gonna hit this button and now you're gonna see that Cubase has started doing my macro. Now again, the marker track is the only one that I do need to click enter because it does not auto fill the name, but you're gonna see it created these four tracks, divided the project window right here. And all I need to do is put this up here and my macro has just worked with a click of a button on my keyboard. So again, this is a very, very powerful tool inside of Cubase so that you're able to create a faster workflow using these MIDI controllers. And none of these buttons, especially this button right here, was not designed to do this. So as you can see, Cubase has overwritten that this button is the macro for my film scoring template. That is really the beauty behind this here. So we're gonna go ahead and do another macro, but this time we're gonna do it inside of a MIDI region. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up an instrument and I'm just gonna place a couple notes in here. So I'm gonna do another macro assigned to the eighth button here and we're gonna see what happens. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a region. So I'm gonna grab my pencil tool and create a one measure region. And then I'm gonna go ahead and draw in some notes. So I'm gonna go and put the quantize back to 16th notes so the lines can adjust. And then I'm gonna create just a C major scale. I'm gonna make them overlap a little bit and I'm gonna go ahead and just make them overlap. And then we're gonna leave this G so that you're gonna see that it's gonna snap on all the way to the right. So the macro that I made was I want the notes to cut off any notes that are overlapping. So that's called delete 
polyphonic notes or overlap. And then we're going to apply legato as well. So in the macro section, I'm going to go into MIDI remote and I'm going to say the eighth button, this one right here, is going to be the apply legato and delete overlap notes. So I'm going to go back into this mapping assistant and then I'm going to go to key commands. I'm going to find where I have the macro section and then where it says legato overlap. I'm going to click on that. So you can see Cubase function turns on and then I'm going to click the eighth button, which highlights it here inside of the nectar. And then I'm going to hit apply mapping. So now this button is going to do exactly what I just said right now. It's going to let me find it again. So now this button is going to do the process for me. So instead of me going in and fixing these MIDI notes, I'm going to hit this button and it's going to delete overlap notes and apply legato, which is going to stretch the G all the way to the end of the region. So let's check it out. And there you have it. It deleted all the overlaps and the G went all the way to the end of the region. So as you can see, you can map these buttons to do whatever you want them to do. However you want them to work, you can lay it out however you want. And you can also create just custom designs or maybe designs that your MIDI controllers already have so that you know where your buttons are and you can remember what key command or macro you're using or what MIDI CC or whatever that case may be. So if let's say you want to do a MIDI CC, you can go into the editor and then we're going to go into... They call it quick functions, so QC. So inside of this window, they're actually called QC for quick control because if you look for it for, if you look for the name MIDI CC, there actually isn't a MIDI CC option. So there's two ways that you could do it. Either you could program it in your MIDI controller. So for example, in the Nectar Impact, I have assigned inside the hardware that this is MIDI CC1 and this is MIDI CC11. I did the same thing for my Nano Control 2, so I made sure that the first fader was MIDI CC1 or MIDI CC11. But watch what happens if I go into the Hans Zimmer strings and I go to MIDI Remote, but then I go and switch to my Korg. It's going to be called Quick Control, and it's laid out to Focus QC1. The Dynamics, which is my MIDI CC11, is going to be on QC2. So what I can do is I can go into my Nectar and then I can assign this first one to QC, Focus Control. I'm going to say Quick Controls here on channel one is going to be QC1 and then I'm going to move the fader. Apply the mapping and now when I go out of here, you're going to see that the fader says QC1 and it's controlling expression inside of the Hans Zimmer library. So again, you got to be careful with that because this MIDI mapping uses QC instead of MIDI CC. Just make sure that when you're doing this, you're referring back to the sample library to make sure that you're doing this correctly. So if I open up the sample library now and you see that I have the Hans Zimmer strings and I move this fader, you're going to see that now the expression controller is going to be moving up and down. Same thing if I assign the second one. So if I go in here and I go into the nano control, it's going to say this is QC2. I'm going to go right back into my nectar, open this up, go into, and I type in QC. I find my Hans Zimmer strings here, channel one, go to QC2. And then I'm going to go ahead and move the second fader and then apply mapping close it and now this one's assigned to QC2 and if I highlight over it it's now called QC2 dynamics when I open up the Hans Zimmer library it's gonna move the second one so now here I have complete control over the dynamic and expression for this library so as you can see you can take this to a whole other level if you program macros if you program MIDI CC's and if you program any knobs to do whatever it is that you want them to do you have a ton of control and you can essentially create your own little touchpad surface just like Hans Zimmer just like Junkie XL and use your MIDI controllers that you have at the moment and not spend any more money and use this effectively inside of Cubase 12. If you have any questions throughout the video just go ahead and drop your comments down below and I'll get to them as soon as possible. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the thumbs up, subscribe. Don't forget to hit the ring button so you don't miss any of my weekly videos. Also, don't forget to visit the John Moon Studios website. I'm going to go ahead and link it down below. There I'll be posting blogs a few times a week so you can stay up to date with everything new in John Moon Studios. Don't forget to share with your musician friends. I will see you guys soon.